Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. My name is Rich. I'm part of the leadership team here at King's and we're now well into our series, Naturally Supernatural. And I want to encourage us, church, let's keep going with this. You know, this is so much more than just a series. As things gradually open up, however long that takes, as we're able to be around more and more people again, God is calling us all the more to be a spirit-led community, to be a people who listen for his voice and who follow him in reaching out and loving those around us. Now, Daniel read to us Jesus' words from Matthew 7, part of his Sermon on the Mount. And on the surface, you might think, what on earth does this passage have to do with being naturally supernatural? Well, over the last few weeks, we've been focusing in on some of the rocks in our hearts. Things like disappointment, unbelief, fear. These things that if they're left unchecked and undealt with, can block the flow of the life and the power of God through us. And this morning, we're looking at the rock of judgment. Now, if we want to live naturally supernatural lives, then for many of us, and I absolutely include myself in this, judgmentalism is a rock that must be removed from our hearts. The judgmental attitudes that we can have, the ways we can tend to see and categorise and box other people. Attitudes in our hearts that if we're not careful can cause us even to write off whole groups of people that maybe God is calling us to love and calling us to reach out to. We want to be people who bring the kingdom of God wherever we go. So we're going to spend some time with Jesus this morning. We're going to unpack what Jesus says in this passage. We're going to look at what Jesus is like with people. And we're going to examine our own hearts to see if there are any judgmental attitudes in us in order that we might root them out and love like Jesus loves. So why don't we pray together? Jesus, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of being called by you to live for you and to love the people you've placed in our lives. We invite you, come. Come this morning and search our hearts. Come and highlight anything in us that prevents us from loving other people. Speak to us this morning, we pray. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The other day, I walked downstairs in our home and the kids' stuff was everywhere. There were clothes on the floor, books on the stairs, the tablet on the sofa. And I said to myself, why do the kids always leave their stuff everywhere? And I walked into the kitchen and there on the side was the hoodie I'd thrown down after work, some letters I hadn't got around to dealing with and the toolkit I'd been meaning to put away for days. And I thought to myself, hypocrite. Sometimes when we take the moral high ground, we need to be a bit careful. As he so often did, Jesus paints this brilliant, vivid picture to illustrate what we're like when we do this. He says, when we're critical of other people, it's almost like we're eye specialists who frown about the tiny speck of sawdust in other people's eyes, when all the while there's a massive, obvious plank of wood in our own eyes. I mean, imagine it. That's a ridiculous image. And I think that's the point. Jesus is saying, look, every time as broken human beings, we look down on other broken human beings. It's like we've got a huge blind spot to our own faults and shortcomings. The Christian writer Glenn Scribner says it like this. When I do wrong, it's out of character. When you do wrong, it's typical. When I do wrong, it's a blip. When you do wrong, it's a pattern. When I mess up, there are extenuating circumstances. When you do it, there's no excuse. And isn't that how we tend to think? We excuse ourselves and we critique others and we apply standards to others that we could never keep ourselves. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The theologian Francis Schaeffer used to use this illustration. Imagine there was an invisible tape recorder hanging around your neck. If you don't know what a tape recorder is, imagine a smartphone app instead. Now imagine it records every moral judgment you've ever made about another person. Each time we hold someone to account, each time we're critical about a neighbour, a colleague, another driver on the road, that's a big one. The tape recorder records our judgment, maybe hundreds of judgments every year, thousands in a lifetime. And now imagine that as we stand before Jesus, he retrieves these recordings and hits play and that every standard we've held to others is applied to us. I mean, honestly, who could stand? Who could stand under that kind of judgment? 
We apply these standards to others that we can never live under. And at the same time, we expect other people to show us mercy and grace. In fact, if we're honest about ourselves, we all need grace. Have you ever had a moment where something of your character that you really prefer others not to see is exposed and unmasked, put out there? I had a horrible moment like this last year in the first lockdown. We'd just been out for another family walk and we got back and we were tired and my wife Alice asked one of our kids to go and do some reading and they reacted really badly. And I didn't really like the way they responded to their mum, so I lost my patience, I got cross and I started shouting at them. Now what I didn't know was that in my pocket, WhatsApp was open on my phone and it had recorded the conversation. And not only that, but at that moment, a 20 second recording of me shouting at one of my kids was being sent to our entire neighborhood WhatsApp group. I know, as I realized what had happened, it was one of those moments where I wanted the ground to swallow me up. And to make matters even worse, as I tried to delete the message, I panicked and somehow instead managed to leave the whole WhatsApp group, meaning that 55 families now had this audio message that I had no way of getting back. And I had to rejoin the group and apologize. It was an incredibly humbling moment. What did I crave and need in that moment? Did I need someone sending me a message of judgment? Call yourself a church pastor. No, I needed grace as I so often do. I might be God's handiwork, but I'm very much a work in progress. And I was so grateful for the message I got from a kind neighbor who said they felt my pain. We all need grace. And as the church, we have a wonderful message of grace that the world desperately needs to hear. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Incredible countercultural message of grace. And you know, life is tough, we all know that. People are broken and lost and looking for answers. And if we want people to open up with us, to lay down their masks and be honest about their hurts and their pains, then we must be people of grace, not judgment. And you know, as the Spirit leads us to reach out and love people, any judgmental attitudes we have about other people will get in the way of so many wonderful things. You can't truly love someone and judge them. You can't truly show grace to someone and judge them. Humility and judgment don't mix. We have a message of grace. And as we step out and love those around us, we're to be people of grace. So how can we begin to remove this rock of judgmentalism that may be in us? Well, first of all, let's call it what it is. Let's call it what it is. See, there's a great difference between judgment and discernment. When Jesus teaches others about, teaches his disciples about not judging others, he's not ruling out godly discernment. In fact, much of his Sermon on the Mount is about teaching his disciples to be discerning and perceptive in how they live, to judge between what's good and what's not, between truth and falsehood. Even in this passage in verse six, he says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. That is about godly discernment. It's about wisely discerning the character of people, perhaps not going on proclaiming the gospel to people who adamantly reject it. But discernment and judgment are different things. There's a story in Luke's gospel where Jesus puts his finger on this judgmental heart attitude in someone he's with. It's in Luke 7 and a Pharisee has invited Jesus to dinner. And as Jesus is reclining at the table, a woman walks in with a jar of perfume. And this is not just any woman, this is a woman with a reputation. And she comes to Jesus and it says this in Luke 7, verse 38. And she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who'd invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. I wonder what life was like for that woman. So we don't know much about her background, what has brought her to this point. She doesn't say a word in this story, but she's clearly broken. And she comes and she falls at Jesus' feet and it gets messy. There's weeping, tears in her hair. 
And now Simon, this religious man, he thinks he's got her sussed. He, he thinks he knows what kind of a woman she is. There's so much in that statement, isn't there? What kind of woman? It speaks volumes about what is going on in Simon's heart. Like he's written her off. Like he's robbed her of any value. You know, sometimes judgment will come out in a comment like this. Sometimes it's just a knowing look. But it always starts in the heart. As far as Simon was concerned, he was being discerning. And if Jesus was any kind of prophet, he'd have sussed her out too. But as the story goes on, it's clear Jesus does know the woman's story. But more, he knows exactly what is going on in Simon's heart. Church, let's beware of judgment masquerading as discernment. These two things are very different. It's a very different heart attitude. Discernment comes from a godly desire for truth and righteousness. Judgment comes from a heart that feels superior, that looks down on others, a heart that says, I'm better than you. Simon Holly writes, judgmental hearts often enjoy judging and take joy in exposing others' faults because it makes them feel more significant. They expose a heart that has forgotten the grace it has been shown. I wonder, does your heart ever seem to forget the grace it has been shown? I know mine does. See, I can read this story and end up looking down on the Pharisee. But if this same woman came up to me on Desborough Road, what judgments would I make? Would something in my heart say she's that kind of woman? Are there whole groups of people that I write off for whatever reason? Something about the way they look, things they say, anything that makes them different to me. Things that might make me hold them at arm's length, things that might make me stop praying for them or stop serving them. What judgments do I make about my friends? about my neighbours, my family members? What's really going on in my heart? And are those evaluations out of a place of love? Do they move me to thank God for his wonderful grace on my life? Or is it just about making myself feel superior and significant? Let's be honest about where these judgmental attitudes are in us. Let's call them what they are, not dress them up as some kind of godly virtue. And rather than looking down on others, let's look in. See, our priority is the plank. Our priority is the plank. Look at what Jesus says. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, Jesus isn't saying here that we shouldn't help and serve others. In fact, the whole purpose of removing the, the plank from our own eyes is so that we can see clearly to help others. But see the order. First, remove the plank. Our priority is the plank. So how do we do that? How do we remove the plank from our own eyes? Well, every time we feel that critical spirit rising in us, every time we notice ourselves looking down on others, it's an opportunity not for judgment, but for repentance. When I see sin in others, my response shouldn't be, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. It should be, well, how is my sin reflected in this? Do I do the same things? Do I sin in a similar way? Or maybe it's my need for superiority that needs addressing. Why do I need to feel superior? Is there something lacking in my understanding and my own identity in Christ that means I need to find significance through looking down on others? Whenever we see sin, it's an opportunity to deal with the planks in our own eyes, to think, well, what is my sin? To fall again on the wonderful grace of God, to thank him that we're dearly loved sons and daughters made righteous through grace alone. See, it's only when we're dealing with the plank in our own eyes that we're able to love and serve people from a place of humility. Because then the whole nature of the relationship is different. It's not that I'm superior and have it all worked out. It's, do you know what? I'm messed up too, in all kinds of ways. I'm a work in progress being saved by grace. I don't have all the answers, but I know someone who does. And people tend to know when they're being helped in humility and they know when they're being judged. And the reality is very few people get judged into life change. I mean, what was it that made people from all walks of life come to Jesus? We see in the gospel stories, people walk miles to get close to him. And all kinds of people, prostitutes, lepers, the sick, the hurting, those overcome with shame, people who other people are totally written off. What was it about this man that made people come to him? It certainly wasn't that he was soft on sin. See, Jesus' friend John writes about him, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. 
And there it is, grace and truth. Truth and righteousness and integrity mixed with the most wonderful love and kindness and mercy. See, Jesus never wavered on the things that were true, but he was also so full of grace and forgiveness. Jesus never wrote a person off. He saw beyond reputations. In each person he encountered, he saw a human being with worth and value, and he honoured people in the way he spoke to them. He honoured people in the way he treated them. See, people run a mile from judgment, but humility, mercy, honour, those things are incredibly countercultural and incredibly attractive. Most people don't get judged into life change, but many people get loved into life change. And when we deal with the planks in our own eyes, we can see more clearly to love and serve others from a place of humility, to honour people instead of writing them off. In his book, No Perfect People Allowed, John Burke writes this. If you saw a Rembrandt covered in mud, you wouldn't focus on the mud or treat it like mud. Your primary concern would not be the mud at all, though it would need to be removed. You'd be ecstatic to have something so valuable in your care. But if you tried to clean it up by yourself, you might damage it. So you would carefully bring this work of art to a master who could guide you and help restore it to the condition originally intended. When people begin treating one another as God's masterpiece waiting to be revealed, God's grace grows in their lives and cleanses them. As we take seriously Jesus' call to love the people around us, will we see the mud or will we see the masterpiece? See, a religious, critical heart will always see the mud on other people. That's judgment. But a heart touched and changed and humbled by grace will see the masterpiece. We'll focus on the value and the worth of the person underneath. That is honour. How do we deal with the judgmental attitude in our hearts? By calling them out for what they are. By dealing with the planks in our own eyes. And finally, of course, by coming back regularly to the cross. Because, of course, there is only one person who really has any right to judge others. There's only one who has any right to feel superior. There's only one without a plank in his own eyes who can see clearly enough to see the, the great depth of sin in the world. And that's Jesus. And, you know, he sees it all. Not just the things that we say and do, but every attitude of our hearts. Every time we judge others by standards we don't keep ourselves. Each time we look down on others and treat people with disdain. Jesus would be well within his rights to stand back and point out all our wrongs. But here's the shocking truth of the gospel. That instead, he comes. He comes down into this broken, unforgiving world. And he lives the perfect life that we never live, free from any sin, free from any unrighteous judgment of others. And then he's beaten and whipped and scorned and he's nailed to a cross to take the punishment for all our mess and our shame and all the ugly stuff that goes on in our hearts. And he deals with it there once and for all. That is the wonderful truth of the gospel. That instead of standing back and saying, shame on you, God chooses to take all our shame on himself. What grace, what glorious truth that Jesus came into the world not to judge but to save. And now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. As we look at Jesus there on the cross, as we see his compassion and his unwavering grace, and as we begin to comprehend just a glimpse of how much we've been forgiven, how can we but show grace and compassion to others? We have a wonderful saviour and we have a wonderful message of grace for the world. So as we look to live naturally supernatural lives, let's be a people who examine our own hearts, who repent of any judgmental attitudes in us, and who come back regularly to the cross of Christ so that we can love and serve others from a place of humility and grace. Amen. Amen. And we're going to worship again in a minute or two. But let's just take a moment here to examine our hearts. As I've been speaking, I wonder what has God been saying to you? What is God saying to you this morning? 
Is there anything he is underlining? Is there any heart attitude that he's asking you to repent of? Maybe for some, there's a moment that comes to mind where something in your heart has caused you to back off from someone, to keep them at arm's length. Ask God to speak to you now. Or maybe you know actually it's deeper than that. It's a mindset. Maybe you know your heart has become hard to people. Perhaps there are whole groups of people that you're writing off. Let's have a moment here with the Lord. What is God saying to you this morning? What is he asking you to do? Maybe you want to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you want to ask him to change and soften your heart. Just ask him now. Father, how easily we forget the grace that you've shown us. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you chose not to condemn us, but to forgive us. We thank you that you chose not to back off from us, but to come close. We thank you that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and that now we're covered in your righteousness. What grace. Lord, would you soften our hearts? Would you help us to love people like you do? And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.